Jesus, you're pruning the dead things away. Jesus, you're planting the seeds in the grave. Growing the garden that hope would take weight. Once again, Jesus, you're calling the dry bones to raise. Trading my shadows for reasons to praise Growing the garden that hope would take weight Once again
But no matter what age we are here today, gathered in this room, you're not finished with us. The story's not over. We can rest in this, knowing that you are the great gardener of our souls. We thank you for this, Lord. We thank you that you're orchestrating all things together for your good. We can trust you, good, good Father. Amen, church.
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne, and he shall come. Shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in, dressed in his righteousness alone. Together, fall this day before the throne. When he shall come. cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. How many people have been there before where you just needed some of God's love to strengthen your inner man or woman? Does anybody need that this morning? Come on, let's pray together as we transition the service. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you that in our weakness, your power is made perfect. In our weakness, by your love, by your power. And God, we come to you this morning in adoration and praise, seeking your face. And we pray that you would pour out your love in a new and fresh way on each and every person in this room. We thank you, God, for your love. We thank you, God, for your love. How many people are thankful for his love this morning? Yeah. Amazing. Well, my name is James. Before you're seated, say hello to somebody. We got a special morning this morning. We are about to transition into some baby dedications. Say hello to somebody. Greet somebody. Give somebody a hug. Amazing, 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 amazing. Well, I don't know about y'all, but these are some of my favorite Sundays when we get to 
take a moment as a church family and recognize that as a larger family, we are all called to help steward the young people within our church and within their lives. Help them become followers of Jesus. From the beginning, God's plan was a family. He created Adam and Eve and said, I'm gonna in, in, uh, help my kingdom go forward through family. And how many people know that it takes a village to raise a child? So I know sometimes we can be up here and like kind of watching these families saying, oh, that's so cute, I love it, God bless them. But what I wanna do is as a church family, have a moment of participation and begin to right now even just pray for these incredible children as their parents dedicate them to the Lord. Like Hannah did with Samuel, where she said, hey, I'm gonna give my child back to you, God. We wanna do that as a family. So we're gonna introduce these amazing individuals and uh, hear their names and then pray for them. Does that sound good, team? Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Good morning, how are you? Good, good morning, church. <laughs> good morning, church. What's your name? Gislaine. Gislaine and? Raphael. Raphael, and who is this little sweetie we're gonna pray for this morning? Isabel. Isabel, come on, let's give it up for Isabel. Was there anything when you named her Isabel that you felt the Lord uh, speaking to you guys? Yeah, we named her Isabel because Isabel means um, devoted to God. And uh, our child is devoted to God and we wanted them to be raised in the Lord's way because this is the best way, right guys? Come on, let's give it up. Devoted to God. So why don't you stretch out your hands to Isabel and we're gonna pray together as a church family. God, we thank you so much for this incredible family. God, we thank you that even prophetically they named their child to be devoted to God, devoted unto you, Lord, in your way, in your kingdom. And God, we pray a blessing over her, health and strength, wisdom and courage and boldness, and God, just a, an ability to demonstrate even at a young age what it looks like to follow you Jesus so God we pray for them as parents that they would have wisdom and strategy love in their hearts care in their in their hearts God to be able to steward Isabel in your ways so God we pray a blessing as a church family and we say yes and amen to all your plans and purposes for Isabel's life so God we thank you for this incredible family we bless them in Jesus name everybody said Amen, amen, amen. We have an amazing little gift for you. Bless you guys. We're so excited. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? Wonderful. What's your name? Stacy. Stacy and? Justin. Justin. And who is this little sweetie? Livia. Livia. Come on, let's give it up for Livia. Amazing. And was there anything you guys felt over your baby? We thought about Jesus' life and Livia means life. Life, life, John 10, 10, Jesus came to give life and life abundantly. So why don't you stretch out your hands and let's pray for this little sweetheart. God, we thank you so much for your life, your life, the life that you have given each and every one of us. And as we pray over your daughter this morning, God, life and life abundantly, life and life to its fullest. And God, we pray a blessing over them as parents. God, energy and strength, perseverance and love, wisdom and strategy, God, as they help steward their child towards your kingdom. God, we pray a blessing over them that you would fill them with love and passion for their child. So God, we bless them and we thank you for them. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Come on, love you guys. Congrats, grandparents. Wow, 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 wow. How's it going? Good. Good. What's your name? DG. DG and? Tony. Totally. And who is this little guy? Uluwakamiye. One more time? Uluwakamiye. Exactly. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> How are you, love, my man? And what does the name mean? Uh, it means the Lord has found me worthy. The Lord has found me. Wow. Wow. So why don't we stretch out a hand and pray for this young man of God. Look at these eyes, wow. 
And God, we thank you so much for this child. God, we see greatness in him. We see greatness in his eyes, a call of God on his life. And God, we pray that you would surround him with a hedge of protection over his life. As the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but God, you came to give life and life abundantly. And God, use him as a mighty instrument in your kingdom. So God, we pray a blessing over the parents. God, would they have rest and peace and joy? Would their home be full of life and love and blessing, God? And as they seek your face to steward this young man of God, would there just be joy in the work? Because it is work, but would there be joy in it? That they would see him come to serve you with all of his heart, all of his mind, all of his soul, and all of his strength. So we bless him in the mighty name of Jesus. Bless him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Love you, love you, love you, love you. And last but not least, how's it going? Good. Good. What's your name? Alondra. Alondra and? Emil. Emil. And who's this little sweetie? Ayla. Ayla. And was there any uh, sense from your guys' heart in this name? Um, we just really liked the name. Hey, totally fair. Um, I guess it does mean oak tree in Hebrew, so. <laughs> okay, okay. I see it there. Well, let's stretch out our hands to Ayla and pray and bless her. So God, we thank you for Ayla. Oak tree, one who's strong and rooted. God, we pray for a rootedness in your spirit, in your word, in your life. And God, we thank you that as their parents are following you devotedly, wholeheartedly, God, that the demonstration of what it looks like to be rooted in your love would play out in front of her day by day, minute by minute. And God, as they steward Ayla, God, for your kingdom, would there just be blessing and joy and presence of God coming behind them, going before them, giving them wisdom, giving them strategy, giving them the know-how how to steward your daughter, God. So we pray a blessing over them. Bless them, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And would their hearts be full of joy as they parent and work and the sleepless nights and the countless diaper changes and the feeding and the rest of it, God. Just bless them with strength and perseverance and love in their hearts for their daughter, Ayla, that she would know their love and ultimately know your love. So, God, we bless them. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen, amen, amen. Come on, it's such a beautiful moment, church. Thank you for joining with us and praying. Let's welcome Pastor Cody. This is an extension of our worship. Are you with me? Uh, that we are devoted not just to our God, but to one another and to his children. Uh, the Lord has entrusted us to be family, to be parents. You know, the Apostle Paul, I only really uses the language of children and family uh, in, a, in a bit of a metaphorical sense that we are family. These are our children together. And as another extension of our worship, not just dedicating children, but also with our finances and our generosity. So we're gonna take a moment now uh, to extend our worship even further, not just from singing or dedicating children, but also uh, with our finances, with our first fruits. And I know many of you have come this morning prepared to give, and so we're gonna take a moment now and just pray for the offering together that our God would multiply what it is that we're giving back to him. So let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your kindness and generosity to us. And God, we give back now this morning what you've entrusted to us. We ask that with our finances, you would do abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. God, thank you uh, for your faithfulness to us. Uh, God, we just wanna be faithful to you. And so we thank you for who you are and we give back to you now and we pray these things in the name of your son and our savior, Jesus. And together we all said, Amen, amen. There are many ways you can give. They're on the screen behind me. Uh, if you're new or joining us, there is no obligation to give this morning. We're just delighted that you're here. And if you are here for the first time, uh, my name is Cody. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. I have the privilege of being a part of the pastoral team here. And we have a booth uh, called, uh, we have a connections booth. And it serves two key purposes. Uh, one, if you're new or joining us, we just want to meet you and get to know you. 
It can be easy sometimes to slip in and slip out. And I know maybe some of you are in a season where that's what you need. You just need to be ministered to and slip out, but we don't want you to slip away. We really want to know you. And so if you could take a moment and stop by and see us, we would love that. But also uh, we believe in discipleship here at First Assembly and we wanna help you take the next step in your discipleship journey. And one of the ways that we can do that is if you come to our Next Steps booth, we can help connect with you and get you on journey for your next step. Does that sound good? Awesome, I have one announcement before I introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, camp registration is not only open, yeah, okay. It's not only open, but it's already almost sold out. Uh, yeah, that happened fast. And so if you have children or you know children in your family or extended family uh, and camp would be a great fit for them, we just wanna encourage you now, today, go online, fa.church slash camps, get those young people registered because uh, you wanna do that before it's too late. You wanna do it before it's too late. And camp is an incredible time to be with like-minded people, to learn from the word and to have fun together. I know so many young people who have life-changing experiences at camp. And so we just wanna make a way for kids to do that. And so, and if you're here, I, I think I can say this, if you're here and uh, you do have young people in your life, but maybe you can't afford camp registration, come talk to us. We wanna make a way for your children to be able to come to camp. And so let, let's make sure that nothing stands in the way towards an incredible life-changing experience for them this summer. Well, that's all from me this morning. I wanna introduce our speaker now. Uh, we have the immense privilege of hearing from a seasoned veteran this morning, a great theologian and scholar, but more than that, just a great pastor and a great spiritual director. So will you join me this morning in welcoming my friend, uh, Bob Osborne. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bob, which means, I think, to float in a pool. I'm not sure. Something like that. Yes, Lord. <laughs> so my mother had great aspirations for me. I see him, I see him floating in a pool. Uh, actually, she said, uh, it sounded like a man's name, but this is in the 50s. And nobody's calling their kids Bob anymore. Have you noticed that? And I was lamenting that one, one Sunday in church. And then after, a couple came up and said, this is our little boy, Bob. Wow. Oh, my goodness. That was wonderful. Good to be with you. Uh, we begin our series in the Psalms, the summer series in the Psalms. And it's been my practice for years now to pray the Psalms as part of my, almost every day, I, I pray a Psalm. So it's been our prayer book. You know, we all learn to pray by model and example. It's just the way it is. If we say we pray spontaneously, I would say, I don't think so. <laughs> we pray out of the cadences and the language and the rhythms of that which has been modeled for us. So this summer, as we listen to the Psalms being taught, we are actually being introduced to our prayer book, which has been the prayer book of the people of God. If you read the prayer of Jonah in Jonah chapter two, when he's in the belly of the fish, almost line by line in his prayer is from the Psalms. Jesus prayed the Psalms. Throughout history, the church has prayed the Psalms. We ought to pray the Psalms. So I wanna talk about the varieties of prayer and varieties of speech. You know, I, I do think we need to learn to pray in more than one way. And, uh, you know, reading a book, something like uh, Richard Foster's book on prayer, which is a great resource for you, it's just simply called Prayer, Richard Foster, will introduce you to all the ways of praying. Uh, learn the different keys and notes and languages of prayer. Praise is basic to the Psalms. Maybe that's basic to our prayer. It's basic to our worship this morning. We've sung praise. Praise is the ultimate end of the Psalms. Everything leads to praise. Psalm 50 is an exuberant psalm of praise, and it ends, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. All of life, we believe, will flow ultimately to the praise of God and his glory and our well-being in him. When my daughters were young, and they were pastor's kids, I came downstairs uh, I was on my way, I had a downstairs office, on my way down there, and one of my daughters had all her Barbies lined up with their hands up like this. 
because you know, she got, they just kept getting Barbies from the uncles. You know, what do I get them? And they got another Barbie and they had this box full of Barbies. And here are all these Barbies with hair askew, some topless Barbies. But they were all worshiping, their hands up like this. She had them all lined up in the couch. So I came to church that Sunday and said, if we don't worship God, the Barbies will cry out. So praise is basic, but it's not the only form of speech in the Psalms. And this is what we start to learn as we read through the Psalms. Praise is basic and praise is ultimate. But there are other forms of speech, and I'm going to mention lament this morning, because maybe when we come to the Psalms, we say, oh, okay, this is how it works. Praise the Lord. He's good. But what about this language of lament? What is lament? Complaint, sorrow, the expression of pain, giving words to the confusion, perhaps, or the disappointment within us, the disorientation of our souls where things are not working the way that we expected or hoped. So in the Psalms where everything leads to praise, we also have room in our speech for lament. And in fact, somehow they work together, as we're gonna see today. That lament helps us move through to praise. So we don't want to ignore lament. And you know, it's not often a practice in our church. Growing up in the Pentecostal church, I. Didn't hear often read the Psalms of Lament. We don't know what to do with them. So get this, there may be about 40 Psalms of Lament in the Psalms, maybe up to a third. And uh, out of those 40, let's say, uh, all but two begin in lament and transform to praise. All but two of them begin sad and end sad. (laughs) So sometimes that happens. (laughs) Sometimes you'll have that moment. But here's what happens in the Psalms. When that lament is directed and given to God, somehow in the alchemy of God and in his spirit, he takes our sorrow and our confusion and something happens in the transformation of the soul as we give him our sorrow, as we give him our complaint. And this is how it works. God does something for us as we give him our truthful speech about where we are. So I want to assert today that lament is part of the language of prayer and necessary. In a broken world, lament is necessary. But I also want to assert, as you're going to hear today, that lament, when it's only complaint (laughs) and directed in the wrong way or to the wrong ears, becomes destructive. So this is about yes to lament and no to dumping on each other or especially onto our children. Yes to lament. No to indiscriminate complaint. Careful speech. So I was taught to speak in a certain way growing up. Uh, my dad was especially that way. He, he wanted to keep things happy and he wanted to be positive. That was my dad. Uh, and there were really good qualities there. He didn't want to run anybody down. He didn't like gossip. He would talk about gossip good. Tell me something that somebody did that was good. And, and, I, and I've learned that practice. Don't share the bad, share the good, spread it around. So that was dad, and he had that aspect. Now, my mom truly was a saint, but she was much more earthy in her speech. She would let you know what she thought. And this was very evident when she watched her Vancouver Canucks play. Hello. Hello. So to be a Canucks fan is to, to know about suffering. Lament. Yeah, and lament. Yeah. And so she, was a, she would sit on the edge of her seat. My mom was a hockey fan. Um, she would sit on the edge of her seat watching the Canucks, and then she would say, oh, you stupid guys, stuff like that. You idiots. Uh-oh. And my dad said, now, Edith, they're trying their best. <laughs> so I think I'm a mix of my mom and dad. Generally, in public, I try to say the nice things, but you know how it is. It's the same with you, too. The more personal the speech becomes, especially with your intimate relationships. I am a spiritual director, I talk to people, but I also have a spiritual director. And I know with my spiritual director, I have the freedom in the moment. It's actually for that place. 
where I can give my heart and say, this is how I really, this is the brokenness of my heart right now. This is the sadness. This is the, this is the frustration I have. So I know where to put that. I, I know that my wife receives some of this too. <laughs> the more intimate the relationship, the more that we can actually share the true state of our heart. But we have to be careful with that. Here's my question then. How can we be people of praise and of faith and still let out our lament? May God give us the grace to do that. I've had a cold recently. It's not COVID. (laughs) Where did, you know, I thought colds went away. I don't know. They came back. A few years ago, I came across an article by Lara Boroditsky, How Language Shapes Thought. She's a cognitive psychologist from Stanford, in other words, a really smart person. And uh, she contends that our thoughts are actually sourced in our language, that you change your language, you can change your thought structure. She gives an example of a five-year-old Aboriginal girl from Australia who, uh, when she was asked to tell where North was, immediately pointed in the right direction without hesitation. And then Bordisky said she asked a crowd of advanced Western people where North was. If I asked you right now where North was, uh, we're not so oriented to North. We might know it, but we can get it wrong. Bordisky made the point that that young girl's Aboriginal language was infused with the, with the language of direction, North, South, East, West, And they would actually say, not left or right, or behind or in front, but they would say, my cup is northeast of my plate. (laughs) Or my brother is south of my father. It was buried in their language. I think in the language of the Psalms is buried how we orient ourselves towards God no matter where we are. So that we don't sing one tune, but we say, okay, here I am right now, I'm angry. Can I find God in my anger? Or do I have to somehow falsely back out of that and come around to praise? No, right where we are, in the language of the Psalms is the language of faith. So to help us see this more clearly, I wanna reference Hannah, the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel 1. James referenced Hannah this morning. Hannah is is one of my favorite stories Now, let me just tell it to you briefly. Hannah is married to Elkanah, and they have no children together. And here's the complicating factor in the story. Hannah also has a second wife, Penina, and she pops out children left and right. So you understand, the Bible doesn't always tell us whether something is wise, like having two wives. It just tells us what is, and then it lets us figure out what the wise course of action would have been. But that's the story. And because Hannah is without children, she is filled with the deepest grief, okay? This is not a story about whether uh, having children completes us. It's a story of Hannah's own particular grief, and we have to understand that. And Hannah is filled with despair in some sense, a sense of incompleteness in her own heart and life. And the story is told that they would go every year to Shiloh to to worship and to prayer. And one particular year, Hannah, uh, at Shiloh in prayer, all of a sudden, the story is told, she stands up (laughs) in the place of prayer. Out of her grief, her frustration, her deep sorrow, she suddenly stands up and she is bitterly weeping as she makes a vow to God. If, Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you for your service. Eli the priest is sitting on the side, watching her. He doesn't understand her. Maybe he doesn't understand deep grief. Maybe Eli only knows religion in one form. He doesn't know lament. (laughs) Maybe. And he confronts her, and he tells her to put away her wine. He thinks she's drunk, and she says, I'm not drunk. I was pouring out my heart to God. It's such a unique moment in biblical history. As we've been watching, we've been watching mostly men pray, almost exclusively men pray, and now we have a woman praying, and she's not praying out loud, she's praying deeply from within her heart. Such a unique moment in the story of of the revelation of God, in the story of faith. Paul talks about, doesn't he, groaning in Romans 8. He says, creation groans 
as it waits for the revelation of the children of God. We groan (laughs) as we wait for our full redemption. The Holy Spirit groans and groans within us in our prayer as we long for fulfillment and completion. We groan in prayer. There's an aspect of, Lord, how long, right? The old Jewish prayer, Lord, we know you will help us, but would you help us before you help us? (laughs) How long, O Lord? There's this groaning. Hannah stands up and weeps bitterly. She gives her heart in its lament to God. And so the priest as he hears what Hannah is doing as she explains herself, this is what I'm doing, does what he's supposed to do. He blesses her. He says, go in peace. The Lord has heard you. May the God of Israel grant what you have asked of him. The family returns home. This is not a miraculous birth story. This is a story of somehow Hannah's womb is unlocked. And in the course of time, she conceives by her husband, Elkanah, and has a son, Samuel which means heard of God. Isn't that a beautiful story? Samuel, very important prophet. Very important prophet. Leads Israel and then becomes the man who anoints the Davidic line. He anoints David as king. David becomes the line of the Messiah. And Jesus is born out of that line. And we could say, we could back up Our whole story right now, back to the story of a broken-hearted woman who poured out her lament to God. Oh, my goodness. This is powerful stuff. Lament given to God can change history, which is entirely different than complaint directed around us, but given to God. So you zoom out the picture from Hannah in her tears And you realize Israel itself at that moment was frustrated and stuck and stalled. Israel herself had come to a moment of stall. And it was Hannah's own uh, personal experience given back to God out of which God bore fruitfulness in her life that God changed Israel's course of history. Amazing. I had a Hannah moment in my life in my 40s, probably I've had a few, but there was this one moment that was so particular, memorable, memorable for me. I was stuck. I was in my early 40s, and I came to a season where I felt somehow stuck. And that's the best way I could think of it. And somebody prayed this this morning in prayer, and it was just a beautiful confirmation of the Holy Spirit as somebody prayed about being unstuck this morning. So here, maybe this is what God is saying to us this morning. But I felt this in my early 40s, and I was contemplating Hannah, and I poured out my heart in my little basement (laughs) study, poured out my heart and wept, gave it to God. And I don't know how to explain this, except I felt like something turned over in me. It was just, it it was a sensation, but it was hardly perceptible. It was just something so personal. And I just felt like I had been heard. And I I just left it there and I left my basement study and I went on with the day. And in the course of time, things changed. In the next few months, things started to open up. It was almost like it wasn't a miracle. It was more like, uh, let me get you out of the mud. (laughs) Let me get you unstuck. Let me help you get going. Psalm 73 is our psalm. So I'm gonna just do the very simple thing and walk through this over these next few minutes and then we'll conclude with a moment of prayer. Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph. Who is Asaph? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, But he wrote maybe a dozen psalms. So he's one of our contributors to our songbook. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Asaph starts us on the ground we know. But you might notice here he's making something of like a moral calculus here. Uh, God is good to those who are good, (laughs) to those who do and say and believe the right things. If you're good, God will be good to you. Uh, But have we ever had that way of thinking tested? Because Asaph is gonna quickly show us now 
how the rappers come off and how he struggles. So he says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So off come the rappers and Asaph is no longer polite or careful in the speech. Um, Things aren't making sense, he says. The wrong people are getting ahead and it's upsetting. Penina is popping out children left and right (laughs) and I can't have any. That does not make sense. I had a big fall some years ago. He he says here, my feet had almost slipped. I had a really spectacular fall that if you would have seen it, you would have given it a 9.8 or a (laughs) 9.9. It was spectacular. Susan and I were uh, trying to get all our Christmas shopping done in one day. So we were doing all our shopping and at the very end of the day, stopping the superstore for some groceries. And now this is the context. All day I'd been saying to Susan, watch out for the ice because it's slippery. Because those boots you're wearing have no practical purpose. They're just style. That's all they are. They, they don't look like they would do anything for you on the ice. No, I like these boots, she says. Okay, be careful. And I'm always helping her and whatever. So at the very end of the day, after I preached to Susan all day long, we're running, uh, sort of jogging across the parking lot because it's cold and I've got my hands in my coat like this and sort of just, you know, like this. And I step on the sidewalk And it happened so fast. My feet went right back and my noggin crashed onto the sidewalk from a height of six foot three. Bang, my glasses smashed, big gash through my eyebrow. And I guess I, you know, I had my hands like this. When I fell, I fell straight down, broke several ribs here from my elbow. And it was so spectacular, somebody called 9-11. So... (laughs) And Susan said, oh, he's fine. And I'm bleeding. And that's what you get when you're married to a nurse, right? She's not the compassionate, caring type. She's more like, you're fine. Shake it off. No, it was a huge fall. And I did break ribs and it was a painful thing. But you know what what occurred to me is be careful lest you fall. Falls are dangerous things. I nearly lost my foothold, said Asaph. He's a songwriter. He's a psalmist. He's he's in the he's probably a religious leader in Israel of some kind. And he's upset with the jerks. (laughs) That's a religious term. That's a theological term, the jerks. He says, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Is what Asaph's saying true? And here we realize suddenly that prayer is not, is not accurate speech. Prayer is honest speech. I say all, thing, all kinds of things to God that are not actually accurate. <laughs> I say to God what I feel and see. And that's where he works. I report in from where I am. Here's where I am, Lord. We suddenly realize this. Prayer is not so much accurate speech as honest speech. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. This is quite a rant. I I know people think of me as a mild-mannered person, but I can rant. So can you. (laughs) And then he says, therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. It's kind of an enigmatic phrase. It just simply means that the final thing to say about these jerks is that they're popular and that people follow them. They still get a crowd. It's it's very upsetting to Asaph. He's very upset. He's confused. And just consider now for the moment how raw and unfiltered the emotion is here. This is what it is. It's full of emotion. But then all of a sudden what happens for Asaph, he has this sense of futility. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. Big sigh. You know, a sigh is a prayer. You know that, right? Give words to my, you know, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sighing. 
It also says in the scripture that Jesus sighed. <laughs> Your sigh is a prayer. And Susan knows my sighs. She also knows when I drum my fingers on the table. She says, what are you thinking about, Bob? <laughs> and here's uh, Asaph just saying, is it worth it? And he's, he's really emptied his complaint, and now he's just sort of backed inward and said, <sighs> and then comes this realization. Look at this. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. What has been happening here is that Asaph has been pouring out his words and his thoughts, his lament to God, and he has this realization that putting it in the right place is, is important, but putting it in the wrong place is destructive. If I had spoken like this to the wrong people, to God's children or even to my own children or to this generation of children, I could have done a lot of damage. If your soul is burdened, there are the right people to talk to in the right way where your lament can be given to God. And then also we know that we can be entirely destructive in our complaint and indiscriminately put it where it ought not to be. Asaph says, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God and then I understood their final destiny. Asaph comforts himself in this thought that in the end God will put everything right and he also knows there's some things that you just can't plummet in understanding. That there are sometimes limits to the understanding of things. But this is not the end of the psalm or its point. The real point of the psalm is this, that Asaph realizes that his complaint, if wrongly handled and wrongly held in himself, can do something of harm to him and others. And so here's what he says. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast to be for you. What an amazing point of self-recognition. That when he is in this practice of complaint that is not properly given over to God, then he becomes senseless, that is, he's unable to sense the movements of grace, the whispers of understanding, and ignorant that he couldn't really see what was going on. And he recognizes this within himself. So there's a way to complain that is right, and there's a way to complain that is wrong, and may God help us. And so Asaph suddenly awakens to all this. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And so I say, oh, our poor hearts. <laughs> Some years ago, I was finishing a piece of furniture, the chest of drawers, an old chest of drawers that we have. I like to do this from time to time. Take an old piece and finish it. I'm not, I'm not an expert, it's just something, you know, you figure it out. So I was finishing this, one of the first pieces I did, I was finishing this, I was putting on the furniture stripper, you know, brushing it on. And then all of a sudden, the container that I was holding this, the furniture stripper in, all of a sudden, the bottom fell out of it and the whole thing just... <clears throat> What? What's going on? This whole thing's... I had the furniture stripper in a yogurt container. <laughs> no, you, you, maybe you're waking up to what's going on. That stuff is toxic, and it's meant to dissolve sort of all kinds of plastics and whatever. I put that toxic substance in a yogurt container. <laughs> all of a sudden, I woke up. It's like, oh my goodness, I can't do that. I know that our heart simply cannot contain some stuff. We cannot hold it. We cannot hold unforgiveness and bitterness. We can't hold complaint very well either. We have to put that somewhere. <laughs> we have to give it away. Our hearts are really made. Just like your engine is made for oil, you can't just pour maple syrup in there, right? It won't hold that stuff, right? Your heart is made for love. Your heart is made for joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. 
The love of God is the healing uh, substance that flows through you and heals you and makes you human. That's what you were made, meant to contain. You can't hold the bitterness. You can't hold the complaint. You have it, but you have to give it away. So we're introduced to this other language. I know everything heads to praise. We know that. But church, let's enter into our lament and say, God, there's something that's just burning me. I can't understand it, but I can't hold it. I will empty it and give it to you. So lament is a practice that has to be done in our lives. We have to learn to lament in order to move back to praise. So lament is not the end state. <laughs> it's the instrumental state that pulls us back to God. So Asaph says this, I made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Let's bow our heads right now in the presence of God. And I wonder if we could perhaps experience a Hannah moment together as we conclude. Let's take a moment in silence in our place right now to be conscious, perhaps as I've been speaking, you've been conscious of this, of some grief or some complaint or some sorrow that you hold that you would like to give to God. Perhaps there are real tears that you've shed over this. Or perhaps it's more often like just a long standing, it just bubbles out of you from time to time. Just this complaint that leaks out and gets spread around. It's dumped on the people you love. Now, if you would like, if it would help you, I, I, I don't feel this is necessary, but if it helps you in this moment, if you want to do what Hannah did and just stand with that, just stand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or anything. I'm just going to ask you, if you would like, if it would help you, just to stand where you are and to say, as an action, I'm giving this to God, just like Hannah did. If you want to do that, I want to pray for you. Just stand where you are. God bless you. Just if it helps you. Just as an action of saying, Lord, I want to give you my grief. I want to give you my sorrow. I want to give you my anger. I want to give you my frustration. I want to give you that which troubles my mind. If you choose to remain seated, that's fine too. So let's pray. Lord God, we long for the world to be different. We wait for the resolution of all things as you have promised. We do believe you are good and we do believe that all things will be well. All manner of things shall be well. It's your promise and that's who you are. But meanwhile, as we wait, we bring our griefs and our pains to you. And in this moment, like Hannah did, we pour out our soul to you. We give you our complaint, we give you our frustration, we give you the things we cannot handle, cannot hold. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Unlock our hearts. Help us back into praise. us, Lord, an assurance that you've heard us? Would you grant us that? 
pray that in your precious name, your loving, strong name. Amen. You may be seated. Now everyone's eyes up here. I'll be, I'll be Eli now, okay? <laughs> I'll be Eli. Go in peace. The Lord has heard you. God bless. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're new this morning or you're looking for a way to take your next step in discipleship, or let me also say this, if there's any way that you're feeling stuck this morning, uh, will you come connect with one of us at the next steps table? Will you come up front, maybe connect with a pastor? We often have pastors and part of our prayer team here at the front. If you need additional prayer this morning, please come forward. Uh, but uh, friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Yeah, amen. Have a great week, First Assembly.